All right, mates, how's it going? In today's video, chapter 11 of Arthur's Rise of the Lich King. Longest chapter so far by the looks of the script, so let's get... Arthas was fully aware that he was pushing his men too hard, and he could see that Jaina was exhausted too, which made him feel a little bit guilty. But time was cookies. They couldn't afford to stop and rest. They needed to find out what was going on, and then stop it. And Arthas wasn't going to give up. They just needed to get to Anderhall, and then surely this mystery would start to unravel. But as the group approached the gates to Anderhall, they saw black smoke billowing into the sky. And for a second, Arthas almost felt relieved. If the town had burned, maybe the grain was destroyed as well. But he quickly realised that was a horrible thing to be happy about, buried the thought, and then raced forward through the city gates. The buildings were indeed burning, and the thick black smoke was kind of unbearable. He couldn't see any villagers, plus no sign of any undead either, so that was cool. But a voice then arose out of nowhere. I believe you have come looking for me, children. The wind suddenly shifted, causing the smoke to change direction, and as visibility improved, Arthas could see a figure standing right next to him. Sup, bro? Arthas immediately felt like this person was likely the leader of the necromancers, mainly because the guy was smirking like a real smug confident twat, and because he then basically confirmed it by saying, I am the leader of the necromancers. My name is Kelthazard. I've come with a warning. Leave this matter alone. Your curiosity will be the death of you. I thought this magic taint felt familiar. You were disgraced, Kelthazard, for doing precisely this sort of shit. We told you it would lead to disaster and you just carried on bloody doing it. You've learned nothing. Looks like Antonidas' little apprentice has all grown up. And quite the contrary, my dear. I've learned a great deal. I've furthered my research and perfected it. Is this plague you're doing, Necromancer? Keep up, mate. I ordered my cult of the dam to distribute the plagued grain, but I can't take all of the credit. What do you mean? I serve the Dreadlord, Malganis. He commands the scourge that will cleanse this land. The chill then passed over Arthas, which was weird because he was surrounded by fires and stuff. What the bloody hell was a Dreadlord? And what the bloody hell was the scourge? What exactly is this scourge meant to cleanse? The already douchey smug grin on Kalthazard's face only seemed to grow wider by that question. Why, the living, of course. His plan is already in motion. Seek him out at Strathholm if you need further proof. At this point, Arthas decided he'd had enough of this guy's shit, so he charged forward with his hammer. But, poof, the necromancer disappeared into thin air. And since he was gone now, the prince decided they might as well continue with their original plan before making any new ones. As they passed through the village and reached the granary, they could see that it was untouched by the fire that seemed to have claimed the rest of Anderhall. Arthas pulled open the door to one of the buildings, hoping desperately to see crates piled high, but his heart sank when he realised it was the opposite of that. It was empty, and by the looks of it, had been for some time. We're too late. The shipments have already been sent out. Damn it! Arthas, we did the best we... Not good enough though, was it? I'm going to find that undead loving bastard and rip him limb from limb. Arthas then stormed off. He was shaking. He was furious. He'd failed. Again. But after he calmed down a bit, he returned with renewed purpose. North. That's the next place he'll go. Arthas then rode like a man possessed, and the rest of the party struggled to keep up with him. At one point, a huge cluster of undead were standing in their path, and rather than slow down and discuss any sort of strategy, the prince just raced towards them, yelling, FOR THE LIGHT! And whilst he was venting his anger and frustration by swinging his hammer about and yelling incoherently, he caught a glimpse of a tall figure in a fluttering black cloak, standing safe and secure away from the field of battle, watching them. It was Kalthazard, again. Whilst Jaina cleared passage with fireball after fireball, and Arthas' men hacked away with their swords, Arthas rushed to put an end to the man responsible for all of this. And as he reached him, he let out a bellow of raw fury, swung his hammer and smashed Kalthazard right in the knees. And the rest of his men soon joined, just kind of kicking the shit out of the necromancer on the floor and venting their own grief and outrage. Naive fool, my death will make little difference in the long run. The scourging of this land begins. Gah. And then he was dead. Kalthazard's body decomposed immediately, and it was gross. But Arthas just stared, a little bit horrified, but also a little bit delighted. Why did he decompose so quickly? It is believed that <laughs> if necromancers are not perfectly precise in their magic, when they're killed, they're subject to <laughs> that. Arthas then turned to address everyone in the group. We need to ride to Hearthglen. They need to be warned about the grain, if we're not too late already. The death of Kalthazard did not seem to mellow Arthas at all. He was so desperate to not fail again that he even asked the group to continue through the night without stopping. But it soon proved too much for Jaina. After about four hours of running on empty, she fell unconscious and nearly fell off her horse. It took several minutes before Arthas realised Jaina was not riding alongside the group anymore, but once he did, he called everyone to halt and cantered back to her. I'm sorry, Arthas. I know you wanted to make good time and so do I, but I'm just so tired. 
Can we stop for a little while? How long do you think you'll need? What Jaina wanted to say was a couple of days, but what she actually said was just long enough to eat something and rest. Arthas nodded, and as she reached into a pack for some cheese, Arthas paced backwards and forwards, impatiently, before sitting down beside her. And as Jaina took a bite of her cheese, she looked at Arthas, analysing his profile in the starlight. One thing she'd always loved about him was how accessible and human and emotional he was in front of her. But recently, filled with other kinds of powerful emotions, he felt like a knob. She reached her hand out to touch his face and Arthas kind of flinched, as if he'd completely forgotten she was there. And then he smiled thinly at her and asked her if she was done. Jaina had literally only taken one bite of her cheese. No. I'm worried about you. About what this is doing to you. Doing to me? What about what it's doing to the villagers? I have to stop it, Jaina. I have to. Of course we do. And I'll do everything I can to help. But I've just never seen you hate anything like this. Do you want me to love necromancers or something? Arthas, don't twist my words. You're a paladin. A healer as much as a warrior. And yet all I see in you at the moment is this desire to fight. You're starting to sound like Uther. Jaina didn't reply to that. She just took another bite of her cheese. I just want innocent people to stop dying, Jaina, that's all. I'll admit, I'm not a big fan of not being able to make that happen, but once this is over, everything will be fine again, I promise. Arthas then smiled at her, and for a moment, Jaina could see the old Arthas in his face for the first time in a while. Are you done now? Two bites. He'd let her have two bites of cheese. When they finally reached Hearth Glen, they came across several men and dwarves armed with rifles. Weirdly, as well as the smell of gunpowder in the air, there was a pleasant, slightly sweet scent of baking bread. Hold your fire. I am Prince Arthas. What's going on? Why are you all so armed? Sir, you won't believe what's been going on here. Try me. The militia then explained what had been happening, and it wasn't a surprise at all. The dead were rising and attacking. But what concerned Arthas was when they mentioned there was a vast army of these undead attackers. This group of dwarves and men would be capable of handling a small skirmish, but not a whole army of the buggers. So, the prince made a tactical decision. Jaina. I'll stay here and protect the village. Go as quickly as you can and tell Lord Uther what is happening. But go, Jaina. So she did. She created a portal and then stepped through it. Sir, you better take a look at this. Arthas looked over to where Thalric was pointing and noticed some empty crates bearing the mark of Anderhall. What did those crates contain? One of the militia men looked at him, slightly puzzled. Just a grain shipment, my lord. Nothing to worry about. It's already been distributed among the villagers. We've all had plenty of bread. And whilst that guy turned back to his mates and was probably all like, why is that weirdo so concerned about whether we've had breakfast? Arthas finally figured it all out. The grain had reached Hearth Glen and then been baked into bread. And that bread had been distributed to the whole village. And now there was a vast army of the undead. Hmm. This plague was never meant to simply kill people so that necromancers could cast their dark magic and cause the dead to rise. It was the plague itself that was turning them into... Suddenly, one of the militiamen bent over double. And then several others followed suit. A strange green glow pulsed from their bodies as they clutched their stomachs and fell to the ground. And then they died. Holy shit. Arthas's theory was now being confirmed right before his eyes. The dead men around them started to get back up again. These men who, up until a few seconds ago, had been allies. And now the prince and his soldiers were going to have to hack them to pieces. And things went from bad to worse when that vast army of undead that these men had mentioned appeared on the horizon as well. There were buttloads of them. Skeletons, fresh corpses, abominations. Arthas could sense the panic and fear in his own men, so he raised his hammer to the air, and as it glowed brightly, he yelled out, Hold your ground! We are the chosen of the light! We shall not fall! Meanwhile, upon reaching the other side of her portal, Jaina collapsed from exhaustion and a lack of cheese. Jaina, child, what is it? Uther, Arthas, Hearthglen, Necromancers, Kalthazard, raising the dead. Antonidas's eyes widened. Beg your pardon? Arthas and his men are fighting in Hearthglen alone. He needs reinforcements immediately. Uther is at the palace. I'll send several magi right away to open portals for as many men as he needs to bring. You did well, my dear. I'm proud of you. Now go get some rest. No, I have to be with him. I'll be all right. Let's go. Back with Arthas, and he had absolutely no idea how long he'd been fighting. He'd been swinging his hammer non-stop. His arms were shaking from the strain. His lungs felt like they were on fire. It was only the power of the light that had kept him going. And although the undead seemed weakened by the light's power, that seemed to be their only weakness. And they just kept bloody coming. Wave after wave after wave. And it was starting to look like this was it. But, as the prince lifted his weary arms for yet another hammer blow, he heard a voice that he recognised. For Lordaeron! For the king! Finally! Reinforcements! Everyone rallied at Uther the Lightbringer's impassioned shout. And after quite a bit more fighting, the Battle of Hearth Glen was won. Uther then walked up to his student and clapped him on the shoulder. I'm surprised you held it together as long as you did, lad. If I hadn't arrived just then, I did the best I could, Uther. If I had a legion of knights riding at my back, I would have... I was paying you a compliment, Arthas. 
Now is not the time to be choking on pride. From what Jane has told me, what we faced here is just the beginning. Then we should strike at their leader, something called a Dreadlord. His name is Malganis, and he's in Strathholm, Uther, the very place where you were made a Paladin of the Light. Feel free to tag along, I'm going, with or without you. And before Uther or Jaina could protest, Arthas jumped on his mount, kicked hard, and off he went. And Jaina was particularly stunned by this. He just buggered off, without his men, without her. He's feeling the weight of the crown for the first time. This is all part of it, my lady. Part of learning how to rule wisely and well. I watched Terranus struggle with the same thing when he was young. Sometimes the only decision is which is the lesser evil. Sometimes there's no way to fix everything. Arthas is learning that. Once I get the men ready for a long march, we'll be on his trail. You should rest up too. No, he shouldn't be alone. Lady Proudmoore, if I may, it might be good to let him clear his head. Follow him if you must, but just give him a little time to think. So, Jaina mounted up and cast an invisibility spell on herself. And then off she went, to follow Arthas, but also give him time to think. She didn't dare follow him too closely. She was invisible, but not silent. She could see him kicking his horse angrily. Angry that it couldn't go faster. Angry that it wasn't invincible. Angry that he hadn't figured out what was going on sooner. And Arthas himself was deep in thought about how his father would have fared in this situation. Would he have figured it all out in time to stop it and save all those innocent people? Or would he have been as helpless in the face of this horror as Arthas was? And he was so deep in that thought that he almost ploughed right into a bloke that was standing in the middle of the road. What are you doing? I could have run you down. You would not have harmed me, and I require your attention. I spoke to your father. He wouldn't listen. So now I speak to you. I don't have time for this. Listen, boy. This land is lost. The shadow has already fallen, and nothing you do will deter it. If you truly wish to save your people, lead them across the sea, to the west. Arthas almost laughed in the man's face. His father had mentioned some weird prophet had been travelling around the Alliance Kingdoms and rambling a bunch of nonsense. Flee? My place is here, you dickhead. I will find the one behind this and destroy him, and you're an idiot if you think otherwise. An idiot, am I? I suppose I am, for thinking the son would be wiser than the father. I'll leave you with one final prediction, Prince Arthas. The harder you strive to defeat your enemies, the faster you'll deliver your people into their hands. Before Arthas could respond with a whole bunch of profanity, the stranger shape-shifted, transformed into a bird, and flew away. And then Jaina appeared out of nowhere. Sorry for concealing myself, Arthas. I just wanted to... Don't say it. As soon as Arthas turned to look at Jaina, he instantly regretted snapping at her. But she shouldn't have been spying on him. The bitch. He came to Antonidas, too. I sense a tremendous power in him, Arthas. This plague of the undead. Nothing like this has ever happened before. It's not just another battle. Maybe he's right. Or maybe he's some ally of this Malganus jerk. Or maybe he's just a crazy homeless person. I'm not going to abandon my homeland, Jaina. Not for shit. Let's just go. The two of them then rode for a moment before Jaina broke the awkward silence. Uther will be following. He just needs some extra time to prepare the men. But Arthas just continued to stare straight ahead. Arthas, you shouldn't... I am sick of people telling me what I should and shouldn't do. What's going on here is beyond horrible, Jaina. And I'm doing everything I possibly can. So if you're not going to support my decisions, then maybe you don't belong here. Once again, the prince regretted chastising Jaina immediately after doing it. So he grabbed hold of her hand as they rode side by side. I shouldn't have spoken to you like that, I'm sorry. I'm glad you're here. I'm always glad you're here. He then kissed her hand, and she smiled at him. However, as they rode for the rest of the day, they didn't really speak much at all. Not until the sun started to go down and they made camp. Both were too weary to hunt for any food, but luckily they had some jerky and apples and bread and stuff. Arthas went to take a bite of some of the bread before thinking back to Hearthglen and decided, you know what, never eaten bread again. And after they'd eaten, Jaina and Arthas embraced each other. And for just a few brief hours that night, any thoughts of death and horror and plagued grain and profits and all the other shit that was going on faded away as the two of them spooned or something. And we're leaving it there. Bloody hell, that was a long one. In chapter 12, tis finally that moment involving Stratholm and stuff. This entire city must be purged. You know what I'm talking about. As usual, link in the description if you're interested in buying this book. Also, there's links to my Discord server and my Patreon page too. If you enjoyed this video, like, subscribe, all of that bollocks. And all there's left to say is, thanks for watching, and see ya!